is a new event organized in Spain in a place called Vallea. So it's called the Valderan 100 miler and, and make me work harder and make me more and more miserable. S incredibly steep. I mean, so steep that you're on your hands and knees sometimes. And I phoned my wife. This is really, really painful. You're one of very few people who will ever get up there and see that. These old um, iron mines, deserted mines, souls are trashed. So th this, they hurt more actually going downhill than climbing up. Hi, Stephen. How are you? Uh, I'm very well, thank you. Thanks for having me on. Oh, thank you for being here because I know we had to reschedule <laughs> that one first time and then we had technical. That was my fault. That was my <laughs> fault. I'm sorry. And now we're like 26 minutes late because I had technical difficult difficulties in my end. So, yeah, thank you so much. Um, it's OK. So, yeah, I'm super excited to have you on the podcast and on the YouTube channel. And everybody knows Stephen Cousins, but just for someone, you know, if there's anyone there who was hiding under a rock for like a few years, <laughs> that's another running scene. Um, why don't you introduce yourself? Okay. Uh, so, uh, yeah, I, I'm Stephen, Stephen Cousins. Um, uh, I suppose people know me from various different places, really. Uh, if we start, we can start with uh, the film My Run, which is. Uh, many years ago, I started a YouTube channel called Film My Run, uh, and it w the idea was that I take my camera uh, and I film the runs that I do, and that started back in 2014, so seven, eight years ago now, um, and that channel has grown, um, and I've and and my running has changed, and I've you know I've gone from doing the 10 kilometer races up to now doing ridiculous distances 100 milers etc so there's that channel and then uh, a lot of people also know me from zwift because uh, uh in about 2017 i started running on zwift i was cycling on zwift before that uh, when it first started in 2015 uh, but uh Yes, psych so running came just at the end of 2016. And I began live streaming my running on Zwift. And um Zwift themselves picked up on, on this and invited me to become uh I guess a, a, a spokesperson, an ambassador, uh, um to kind of work for Zwift uh, to promote running. So that's what I've done ever since. So I've combined being a, a treadmill runner, a Zwift runner, a live streamer, and also a, an outdoor trail ultra runner, um, and making films about that as well. So yeah, I appear on I appear on YouTube quite a lot. <laughs> oh yeah, I know because I'm subscribed and I have the bell notification for all your channels, and it's like yeah, it's ping awesome ping though. ping. Yeah, yeah, it's awesome though, because at first when I um, the first channel I think I subscribed of yours, I think it was filmed my run, and I was like, oh wow, this is a really interesting concept, and you've run so much. When when did you start running? You started YouTube twenty fourteen. Um, so when did you start? Yeah, running? yeah, but I I mean you know like like many people, I I used to run all. I, I used to just run you know, two miles, three miles. Um, I live near the sea, so I would just go along the seafront and run and enjoy myself and do it once a month or something like that for many, many years. Uh, but then when I turned uh, 40 or just before I turned 40, I had, you know, the usual male midlife crisis. It happens and, to uh, females too. <laughs> just yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. Okay. So, <laughs> And I thought I've got to get fit. I've got to do something more. So I um, I entered my first 10k race, and uh, and then I started doing an event in the UK called Park Run, which is a free 5k run every Saturday. And in fact, it's starting again tomorrow after a year and a half of lockdown. Park Run starts again in the UK tomorrow. So I started doing that. And then I entered my first half marathon in 2011. So 10 years ago, you could say 10 years ago, I start, I did my first half marathon race. And then 
a year after that, I did my first marathon, 2012, which was Paris. My, uh, my brother-in-law lives in Paris. So it's every year we go and visit them. And then every year I run the Paris marathon. So it was, it was every single year until lockdown. And then we missed last year because it, it didn't happen at all. So that was my first marathon. And then I did, I did a marathon a year for two or three years. And then I had a, I have a friend called Richard who uh, said, do you want to come and do an ultra with me? And I swore at him a few times. I said, of course not. Don't be such an idiot. Why would I want to do that? But he talked me into it. He persuaded me into it. And um, so I eventually ended up running 46 miles in the Brecon Beacons in Wales, which is in terms of the UK, the Brecon Beacons is almost as almost as high as it gets really you've got scotland you've got ben nevis and those those are a bit higher and you've got the lake district but wales and the brecon beacons are kind of next on the list of the most rugged gnarly trails that we have and i absolutely loved it i i i I fell in love with it from there on and i've been increasing my distances i've been increasing the the aggressiveness of the trail running that I do ever since really and and now I'm really I, I I'm totally entrenched in trying to find the next the next race that I can do which will push me um, beyond my limits uh, you know and, and and make me work harder and make me more and more miserable <laughs> on the trails <laughs> wondering why on earth I'm doing this and. Uh, Will I ever finish and will I make the cutoff? And uh, you finish, you know, when you finish these things, you think never again. I hated every minute of that. It was awful and I don't want to do it again. And then 24 hours later, you think that was the best thing I've ever done. I loved every minute of it and I want to do it again. Why that happens, I have no idea. But uh, yeah. so that's where I'm at. That's, that's, yeah. I, and so, and, and in any, sorry, in order to do those longer and longer races that are more and more difficult, I've of course increased my weekly training. So every, every year I seem to do more mileage. I think I'm getting to a point now where I, I can't really do much more than I'm doing. Um, uh, right now I run around an average of a hundred kilometers a week, but when I'm training for a big race, it, it will go up to a hundred miles a week. So 160 kilometers or so for a, a couple of weeks, two or three weeks before the race, and I don't think with a family and, and with other commitments that I, ha- I just don't think I can fit in any more time running. So th- there will, you know, it's, it's increased every year, but I think there comes a time and it'll come soon when I, ca- I just can't, I can't do any more than I'm doing. Right. Yeah. It's, um, I mean, I always say the running is such an adventure because when you start running, most of us do it for fitness and health and then it's you never know when it's where it's going to take you if you I start think, yeah yeah the, the the problem is getting when you get the bug when you get caught by running that's the that's when it becomes a, a problem it's like an addiction uh, and it, you know you're very you're very lucky in a way you're very lucky if you can stick to 10 Ks or, or half marathons or even just a regular marathon every couple of months or something and not feel the need to push further. If you're quite happy running along the seafront or, or, you know, uh, running up on the hills once a month and, and that's fine for you and, and you do 20 K a week or, or even less just for enjoyment or fitness. That's great. And the problem comes when when you suddenly think, oh, I wish I could, I'd like to do a bit further. I'd like to try some. I'd like to try this. I'd like to try that. I'd like to go the extra hundred, you know, miles or whatever. The problem that's the problem because running, you know, it's supposed to be a cheap sport. Just get a pair of running shoes and a pair of shorts, and off you go. Oh no, that that's not the truth at all. Backpacks, medical kits, soft flasks you know, different Bye, types of trail, different <laughs> types of shoes, uh, more expensive gear for more extreme conditions, waterproof tops and, and all this kind of stuff, waterproof gloves. 
it, yeah, it then, and then entry prices for trail races and then travel for trail races. It just, it's not cheap. It's not a cheap yeah. sport. Yeah, it's, it's, <laughs> it is interesting though, because running makes us happy. It, oh, yeah. It's, yeah, I mean, it, it reaches a point where um, it becomes sort of an addiction. It, it gives you your and your endorphins kick in and then you just can't yeah you have to do it i was injured for a bit and which brings me to another question for you but i was injured for a bit and i was miserable miserable <laughs> like my husband was like just go out there and run <laughs> like, he just wanted me to go back to running <laughs> it's horrible when you're injured especially yeah it's for a for a runner uh you you do get very um uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Claustrophobic, but also, but also miserable with your claustrophobia, and yeah. you just want to get out there. Um, yeah. It's very difficult, and but you have to things like that. You do have to be disciplined, really, because you you can go out there too early when you're not ready, and and ruin yourself for another five months, six months. So yeah. it, you, you do have to be sensible sometimes. But of course, yeah, it, it is. The thing is, though, rather that addiction than something else, yeah? Oh, you know? <laughs> of course. <laughs> I'll take it a hundred times. <laughs> so have you ever been injured? Or have you been lucky? In yeah, yes. No, I, I mean, I, I think I am lucky with injuries. I don't get injured very often. And, and the only... The, so um, the worst injuries I've had were um, about seven years ago, I had uh, sciatica. So... Um, wow. I was in the, I was just in the house. I, I had some lower back pain and I was just in the house and I bent down quite uh, randomly just to pick something off the floor and a huge pain went down my left side and down my leg. And I was so bad. I called the ambulance because it was oh, that wow. painful. I couldn't I couldn't sit down. I couldn't stand up straight. I was just kind of bent over and it that, I had to have some severe painkillers to ease that off, but that took, I was out for uh, a month, two months with that, just kind of trying to recover. But I have the residue of that injury still today. I have some numbness down my left side and I suffer from quite bad cramping in my left leg uh, on long distance races, which is, I don't get it in my right leg, but in my left leg, and I'm I'm convinced that's as a result of damage to my muscles from that sciatica attack. Um, so that was that. And then the, the next worst injury I've had, I, I wasn't injured for a long time until 2019. And I bought some different shoes. <laughs> and I I am convinced that those shoes weren't right for me and they damaged my foot. And I was out for five weeks. Um, in fact, more, no, more than five weeks. Cause I, I, I didn't run for three weeks and then I tried to do, <laughs> I tried to do a 100 miler oh and, uh, and I wasn't ready and it hurt and I DNF'd after 20 miles. Um, and so then I took another five weeks off, but I knew I had a big race coming up in Chamonix and I, I had to be at that race. I just had to be at that race. Um, so I took five weeks off with no running at all, just to make sure the injury went away and it did go away. But of course, by then I was completely unfit and no running for five weeks. And there's no way I was ready to run this race. And funnily enough, I've just, just yesterday released the video of that race where I DNF'd the, the t it's called the TDS, which is 145 kilometers in Chamonix round Mont Blanc and uh yeah I, I got to 80 kilometers and uh and was not fit enough to I just too, it was so tired there's so much climbing I couldn't do it um so and that year 2019 I had four DNFs um and it was a bad it was a bad year and that so and that's the last injury I had and fingers crossed I haven't had any since um and I, I'm more careful now about buying new shoes, making sure that they're shoes that I'm comfortable with and I know about. Um, right. Yeah. So, 
so yeah, that's my injury story. It's not it's not a huge great story. I don't I don't have a big catalogue of of injuries. That's good though, because with, I mean, with the amount of miles that you run, we all have a limit. But I think yeah, there's, I, there's a line there that when you cross it, yeah, you get injured. I think that's why though. I think that's why I don't get injured very much is because I run so much. I think your body becomes conditioned. So the only time you you know your bones and your muscles, your tendons they 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 have muscle memory they know what they're going to do and they know that they go running every day they know what to expect and they 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 strengthen uh, to deal with that so the only time you're going to get injured is if you if 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 you have a fall of some disc- like an accident right. um or if you do something like you buy the wrong shoes uh, which i did so those are the only <laughs> times you're going to get injured shoes. Yeah, we won't talk about. You know, because you, you know, <laughs> you know, run, new, new runners, new runners have all sorts of niggles. They have knee problems. They have IT band issues. I don't. I don't get any of that anymore. Um, I haven't even had plantar fasciitis at all. Um, I don't know why I haven't had that, but uh, that I did have IT band things and, and knee problems when I first started running. But as I strengthened, as I did more running, they all went away, and I've never suffered with them since. Right. So now I wanted to talk about what you just did two weeks ago. Is it two weeks ago? It's yeah, yeah, two, yeah, yeah. Two weeks ago today. What day is it? Friday. Yes, two weeks ago today I started. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. I was following you because I know you posted on on social media how to follow you. So I was actually tracking you every so often, and I was like, oh my god, I could see the mountains on the tracker. <laughs> and it's <was> like, <laughs> holy cow, this is just amazing because when you were like at the bottom of the first mountain and then you were about to start climbing the other one it was like this has to be mentally so daunting just to know that you're you know you're going down but then there's not because you're you know where you're running so but let's talk about the race so how did you decide Okay, so um, tell us what the race is, and then so so the the race. uh, I don't know if you've uh, people have heard of the organization UTMB, uh, which is Ultra Trail de Mont Blanc. So it's a big. It's 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 the biggest race organization, trail running organization in the world. Um, Some people have a problem with that. They think they've got a bit of a monopoly on trail running, Um, but. there's no doubt that it is the biggest uh, trail running festival, trail running company in the world. And in in the last week of August each year, there's a huge trail running festival in Chamonix uh, and all the top trail runners in the world attend. So it's enormous. So um, UTMB uh, have various other races throughout the year around the world that you can do in order to to gain points, uh, to qualify to run at the uh, event in Chamonix in August. So one of the this this is a new event uh, organized in Spain in a place called Vallea um, or Valderan. So it's called the Valderan 100 miler with uh, 10,000 meters of elevation um, around the mountains of the Pyrenees. In a, it's a looped course, um, starting in Vallea and finishing in Vallea. And um, so I decided that I would like to try this um, in order to qualify to run the main UTMB 100 mile race in Chamonix. So you get points enough to qualify to do that race if you finish this race. So that's why I, that's why I wanted to do it, simply to qualify for, for the main event um but little did i know that actually this event um by all accounts is technically more demanding than the big main event in chamonix um and you're right when you said about being uh, mentally uh, challenging uh, mentally tough i think what you have to do with a race like this is you can't think about everything you've got to do you can't think about the fact that it's 10,000 meters of climbing. You just have to think about this climb and then the next one after that. And then the next one after that, because thinking about it in one big chunk 
will destroy you. And it nearly did destroy destroy me later later in the race. So it was a it was a beautiful day. Um, two weeks ago on Friday, it was glorious sunshine. It was really warm. There were thousands of people lining the streets. There were nine hundred and forty one. 940 or so runners there were there were supposed to be 1500 but quite a few didn't make it over with the covid restrictions etc so we started with just under 1000 runners anyway um and we set off um from vallea at 6 p.m uh spanish time and we had 48 hours to complete the course so the slowest runners would come in in 48 hours they expected the fastest runners to come in in 22 hours, so over a day faster than the slower runners. As it was, they had underestimated the difficulty of the course, and the, the fastest runners, in fact, took 24 hours, so two hours longer than expected. So it, it was more difficult than even the organisers expected it to be. And, it, yeah, I mean, it was just brutal. I, I very rarely use that word because I don't like to um, overhype races. You know, you just get on with them and you do them. But sometimes when you do a race, you go, this is ridiculous. And it was from the first climb to the last climb. So st incredibly steep. I mean, so steep that you're, you're, you're on your hands and knees sometimes getting up the slope so dangerous that if you did fall backwards you were going to roll a long way down a hill and you were in trouble um some sections where you were so close to the edge of a cliff that you really just had to be incredibly careful with your footing or you would fall a long way um so high that in the height of summer there was still snow where we were running um, in some sections, uh, which was great because I, ha I had a plan, um, <laughs> which was to keep cool in the hot weather. I now, my, my wife has sewn together a bandana, which I could put around my neck. And uh, at a previous race, um, we had ice and I put ice in the bandana and wrapped it around my neck and kept me cool um, during the hot parts of the day. And I checked with the aid stations and the organizers whether they would supply ice at the aid stations. They said no. But I took my bandana anyway in my backpack. And sure enough, we got to one of the high climbs and there's snow on the ground. So I got my bandana out. I packed my bandana absolutely as full as I could with snow, put it around my neck and off I went. It was absolutely brilliant. It was perfect. Um, so, yeah. So. Uh, Basically, the idea of the race is you go up a hill or a mountain and you come down into the valley. You go up another hill, you come down into the valley. Most of the aid stations are in the valley. So once you've been in an aid station, you know that you've got to climb out. Um, some of it was in hot, sunny weather. Um, almost all of it was very technical. Some of it was in the dark um, with your head torch on where you could see nothing other than a small patch of light in front of you. Um, those are probably the easiest climbs because you don't know what's coming. You, can't, you just have to keep going until you reach the top. You can't see the top. You can't see anything. You just have to keep climbing until you reach the top. And so as I said before... Know, I ask this to people, people who do trail races, I always, because I'm always afraid I'm going to get lost. So I probably will yeah, never yeah. do a trail race. <laughs> this of this length unless i'm with someone because i am sure i will get lost How okay you so know that you're on the right track okay it, because because and utmb is famous for this utmb ultra mark their courses so if you have gone more than 100 meters and you haven't seen a tiny flag or some red and white striped tape hanging from a tree then you know you've probably gone wrong and you need to go back. So, and then there are, there are other ways, of course. Um, on my watch, you download from the website of the, or, or, or if you've done the run before, you, you use a GPX file, you transfer the GPX file onto your watch, 
and uh, you can navigate using your watch. There's a, just a little line on the watch and you just follow that line. Sometimes the line is not quite right. Uh, GPS is, you know, often it's a few meters out maybe. So you have to just be a, a little bit aware, but you can just follow a line on your watch. But with things like UTMB, such a big organization, they they hyper mark everything. You will not go wrong. You, you simply cannot go wrong. If you do go wrong, um, then I think it's on you, really. You, you, you do need to be, have a little bit of um, sense, you know. If you're, if you're going to take on a mountain ultra where you're traveling 100 miles in the Pyrenees um, in dangerous environment, you have to have a little sense. Uh, you can't go out there naively, you know. So, so, so your own common sense GPX file on your watch and a well-marked course from the course from the uh, organizers of the race. Um, and and you, you, you're going to be OK. You're going to be OK. There are races which you have to navigate by a map and a compass, which are not really marked. There are other races which follow national trails. So you, it's the, the organizers don't mark the course, but there are uh, symbols on fence posts. Uh, that you follow, especially in the UK, there's a lot of that where you follow a trail which is al already a known trail and there are fence posts and you look on the fence post to make sure that the symbol is the correct symbol for the, the trail that you need to follow. So that's another another way that you you won't get lost. But also, you, you wanted me to talk, Suzanne. You wanted uh, yes, me to talk. Yes, I yes. can talk. <laughs> the, the, the other thing, the other, the, the other thing is that is often half the fun of of doing a trail race is going <laughs> is getting lost and going where the hell am i now you know and and, and having to tr go back and find the last marker or you know looking at your watch and going why does my watch say i'm 13 miles off course oh you know God. It's, I would this cry. is just the I would this is the fun down and just cry <laughs> 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 can someone please come get me <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I'm not yeah. ready to do it. I mean, I can't even. I'm so not ready. I mean, not even. Yeah, that's why I find it so fascinating that that someone is actually able to do it, like mentally and physically, and more. I think yeah. more mentally than physically. Like, what was going through your mind? Because if you're out there by yourself, did well. First of all, did at any point did you see other people? Like, once you start running. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, so again, this is another thing about UTMB. Um, such a big organization. The races are full. There are so many people in the races, especially early on. You will be going up a very steep climb in a line of people, okay. literally. So you've got somebody literally right in front of you and right behind you. Um, that early on in the race, that will happen. And, and it's amazing to see at nighttime as well, a you know, you're in the middle of nowhere, but there are 500 people on the same trail with head torches on stretching back for miles and miles behind you. It's sometimes an incredible sight. And also when you look up the hill that you're climbing for miles and miles, and it, that is frightening sometimes when you see a, a head torch literally in the sky above you and you think, I, I'm going up there, you know. Um, so there's, so, so there's that. Um, so yes, you, you are regularly with people on these kind of races. There are of course, plenty of races where there are much fewer people and later on in the race. Yeah. There were certainly times when I was on my own. Um, but again, you just, you have confidence in yourself. You follow the course markings and you just enjoy the scenery as long as you're being aware of your footing and that you're not going to trip and fall because that's the other thing about trail running is it's you do miss the scenery sometimes because you have to be careful. There are even in the most benign places, there is a tree root. And if you trip on the tree root, you sprain your ankle or you crack your head that your race is over. It doesn't take very much at all. So you, so for however many hours you're out there, most of the time you have to be fairly concentrated on the floor in front of you to make sure that your footing is good. Um, and just going back, let me tell you about um, the mental thing then um, and the mistake I made uh, in this race. Um, 
t- two nights of running. So I'd got through the first night. I'd got through the uh, first major day. Come to the second night. Um, I arrived at an aid station where you have a, a drop, what's called a drop bag. So at the beginning of the race, you fill a bag with things that you might need. They put it in a van and they take it to an aid station. And then you are, I was a hundred kilometers into the race. You get to this aid station, they give you your bag so you can change your socks or, sh- or shoes or have your own personal food that you want to eat from that bag. I got there and I phoned my wife because I said, I'm going so slowly. It, I, you know, this is really, really painful how slow it is. And um, she just reminded me that I can do it. I, she, you know, you know, you can do this. You've got the strength to do it. Just look at what you've got coming up. She said, and she said to me, you've only got four big climbs to go. And that's not her fault because she, you know, I should be aware of what I've got coming up. I should know. But as soon as she said that, I thought, oh, no, really? (laughs) Four massive climbs to come. I couldn't. And I lost a lot of motivation, a lot of heart. And I thought, oh, no, I just I can't see how I could just do that. And that's the fundamental mistake. Don't think about four climbs. Just think about the next one. And I had to get that into my head. I had to say, right, forget that just get up the next climb, get out of the aid station, get warm clothes on for the night and get up that next cut. Forget about the ones after that. Just get up that next climb because that's, that's where, that's what will destroy you is thinking about it in one huge chunk like that is scary. Right. So that's what I did. And I got back on track. I have to say, when I saw that you were doing it, I was like, this got to be insane because, I mean, in concept, you know, the Pyrenees are high. I mean, you know, they're yeah, big. Yeah. But I drove, I was in my 30s. I drove from Madrid to Paris and you naturally have to cross the Pyrenees. And I, you're on the highway. And as you're going through them, it was the first time that I was seeing them live. And, you know, the highway is not small. It's a big highway, but you're going through them. And I was like, holy smokes, they're huge. I mean, that's all you see. It's like, so when I saw you were doing them and I pictured the map, I was like, these are not, these are, these mountains are like, like huge. I mean, it's bigger than anything. I've been in the Rocky Mountains here in the United States. I've seen them from an airplane. They're big, but they're not. I mean, this, this is just like, it's, and, and very, very steep. Yeah. It's ridiculous. I've never, I've never been on anything so steep even even in chamonix in the alps they're steep but they weren't they're steep but not as technical whereas in the pyrenees much of the climbing is not only steep but also technical as well so you're going i mean i was covering one kilometer in 30 minutes sometimes oh wow that's you know that's how slow so what is worse, the, the going up or the going down? Is it going down? <laughs> just a steep because... Very good. <laughs> it's a very good question. Very good question. Um, and uh, uh, this is why you, when you train for one of these races, um, it's very easy to forget running downhill. Oh, downhill running is easy. I'll, I'll really enjoy the downhill running. That'll be fine. I'll be able to make up some time. I'll be able to go a bit faster. Oh, no, you won't. Oh, no. Because the downhill is just as steep as the uphill that you've just come up. You can't run down that. You, 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 you slide down that or you, you, you <laughs> tiptoe down that or, you know, or you, you c- crawl down it. And also, so not only is it so steep, but after doing, you know, 50, 100 kilometers of up, down, up, down, your muscles are trashed. So th- th- they hurt more actually going downhill than climbing up climbing up is is not so bad you just have to trudge very slowly to get to the top going downhill you think you ought to go a bit quicker but no you you your legs are hurting so much from the impact going downhill um that you're going almost as slowly downhill so 
yeah and when so when you train you you have to remember to train for downhill running as well because you can train your quadriceps it's your quadriceps that hurt um on the, the front of your leg uh, and you can train that you can do lots of downhill work and, and your legs will survive longer um, if you train well, but they will still hurt. They will still be trashed and you just have to either get over the pain or, or just go slower. Um, I've been known to walk backwards down hills before um, because I can't walk for I can't go forwards down the hill. The, the pain is so much. I've gone backwards um, in, in other races. This race. I was okay. My, my legs, I felt my legs were trashed by about halfway, but they wouldn't, but they never exploded. They never, there's some points when your quads just go and you literally can't walk at all. You can't move. My never, my legs never got to that stage. They were always at a stage where I could do a slow shuffle down the hill. So I could run, I could run a little bit, but, but not very quickly. So it, uh, you know, a slow, a slow 15 minutes per kilometer downhill shuffle, something like that. Yes. <laughs> so what was your, in every race, there's a moment that you remember like, oh, wow, this is glorious. What was your moment? Yeah. Like when okay, you're like so, there and it's like, you're in the moment and you're sort of like, you have that out of body experience of like, oh, wow. Yeah. yeah I'm yeah. in heaven. So <laughs> after to have, to have high moments you have to have low moments to be able to experience the joy you have to experience the pain to have a contrast so i'd have my low moment at the aid station in the, just at the beginning of the night try, knowing i had these climbs to do so this this climb out of this aid station was a very long very high it was a 1500 meters climb and it took me all night to do this climb so by the by the morning, I was we were just getting near to the top of this climb, and the top of the climb was um, snow, um, and also these old um, iron mines, deserted mines that from from a hundred years ago, um, with metalwork and and buildings right on the top of the this mountain with snow and. Um, and then also, um, so uh, we, and we came to the top and then we started to go around the side and we were on a ledge, um, about two meters wide. So not, not really thin, but two meters wide ledge. Okay. To kind of run on, a, you know, not too fast, just be a bit careful with a big drop down one side and valley and mountains in the distance. And we were following a a deserted railway line, a little um, railway line, obviously used for little trucks to transport the uh, the mined material back down. And so we were on the ledge with this old railway line and these these uh, carved out tunnels, only about twenty meters long, but um, uh, just the most incredible view that you you you. you you can't imagine that you would see anywhere else. You know, you'll see beautiful vistas of mountains and, and hillsides all over the world. But this was unique to this place. The mining, the, 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 the tunnels, uh, the rocks, um, and then the view all combined. That was sometime mid-morning on the second day. It was just beautiful and and made you appreciate where you were and the fact that we are so high up very few people are going to make that journey you know you're you're one of very few people who will ever get up there and see that so that was my that was my moment yeah yeah amazing amazing yeah it was you were describing it and I was getting chills <laughs> because that would have been my question like can anybody ever get there you know is there a road or something <laughs> yeah well it's all it it is all mostly on marked tra mostly on trails that that people can walk on and i'm sure there are pe there are hikers who who go up there but in terms of the population of spain it's <laughs> what it's going to be less than one percent of the population will ever oh, will I ever go there like, yeah minimal yeah yeah yeah, sure. yeah. yeah, yeah. we don't I'm from Spain, so we, we don't really yes. appreciate the Pyrenees enough, I think. Again, it, but that's us, the same. It's, it's the same everywhere. It's the same everywhere. I, I, when we moved into this house where we live now, 
uh, 11 years ago. And the people we moved in uh, who lived here before us, when we, we spoke to them and uh, he said, yeah, we've lived, we've lived here by the sea in this house for 30 years. And I've been to the beach twice. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we don't appreciate where we live, do we? We don't appreciate it. Yeah. Anywhere. Yeah, it's just yeah. I think for for most Spaniards, just the Pyrenees is just like a frontier. Like, you know, like it's what separates you from the rest of Europe. So, okay. Yeah, and that's yeah, yeah. what also you know in terms of not to get too like geeky here, but in terms of, like invasions and stuff, that was what <laughs> just kept Spain <laughs> separated from. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Of course. It's, yeah. It's you know, like it's hard to go through the Pyrenees. But you, <laughs> you kind of went through them. So like you just went up and down them. <laughs> <laughs> so so then once you get to the end, like what do you what did you feel when you when you saw the finish line? Well it's funny. Um talking about all the climbing that we had to do um we um there was i was i was very slow i'm i'm not an elite runner i mean i'm i was in this race my whole goal was just to finish there was no time goal i didn't say i wanted to do under 30 hours or all i had to do was finish and protect myself so i finished the the cut off was 48 hours i finished in 46 hours Okay. So only a, only an hour and a half or so under the cutoff. And there was a group of us um, all running around the same speed. And we come to the final aid station, which is eight kilometers from home. We know we've done it. We know we've finished. It's great. We've done it. And all we have to do now is run down the hill into Vallea to the finish. Glorious. Apart from, oh, yeah, no, there's, there's just a small climb, a little, a little climb just to get, and then you go down, yeah? Okay, fine, no problem. Well, honestly, the climb was about 700 meters, and it was possibly the steepest climb of the whole run right at the end. And we're all looking at each other go, what the hell? What is this? <laughs> right, right at the end. We, we thought we'd done. We'd done all the mountains. We've done the climbing. What's going on? And here we are going up again. Um, and it's like this. I mean, it's just ridiculous. Anyway, so we made it to the top and yeah, and I, I tried to run down the hill to the finish. It was so hot. And I remember stopping at two water taps um, in the far farmer's fields. Um, they, have the, they have these water taps, which are continually running for some reason, wasting a lot of water. But nevertheless, um, I dipped my head in the water and, and splashed myself a couple of times. And but the euphoria was there Be from the top of the hill. I knew I was in time. I knew I was going to finish. And it's just, it's just the most fantastic feeling of relief. And they had a great idea on the finish line was to, they had a big bell uh, hanging on the finish line and you just had to go and run under the bell and ring the bell to say you finished. And uh, it was a fantastic feeling. The only, the only slight negative um, with these races is when you're a slower runner there are far fewer people at the finish to cheer you in than when the elite runners all finish there are huge crowds everybody's cheering it's fantastic when i finish there's a small amount of people just clapping you know uh, but it's not it's nice it's a it's it's a it's a great feeling and um that's what brings you back every time crossing that finish line knowing you've done it knowing you've spent 46 hours on the trail in some of the most difficult terrain and difficult mountainous region that you can imagine and you've come through and su succeeded where out of 900 runners half of them didn't make it you know half half of the runners dnf'd um and i was worried at one point that i would be one of those people and it's even more satisfying to know that you've got out of that dark place. You've come out the other side of the dark place and you've made it to the finish line. Let's do it again. Let's do it again. That's what you think. So, <laughs> so what do you do after that? Do you sleep for three days? Like, <laughs> Oh, well, that's the, yeah, that, that's the, that's the terrible thing about trail running because there is, there is a big runner's low 
um, afterwards. Uh, you finished. You've got your your medal. Um, and you kind of have your moment of euphoria on the finish line. And then you have to go and collect your bag, your drop bag, which has been returned to you. You have to walk to your hotel, which when you walk to your hotel after running 46 hours, <laughs> takes nearly as long to get back to the hotel because your feet, once you finish the run, your brain tells your feet that they're finished and it's done and you're over. So getting walking again is impossible and then yeah that that race actually um interesting it finished on the night that um england and italy played in the european championship final so i was trying to stay awake to watch the game in fact i fell asleep during the game and didn't really see any of it and yeah i slept solidly till the next day um and then went to the pool and sat in the pool for a long time to relax my legs. But you do feel there is a, a mental low, really. Um, you've done it. That's it now. Nothing else to look forward to now um, until the next race. And you get over that after a while. Oh, then you want to sign up for another one. <laughs> yeah. So are you running the big one? The big Chamonix? Yes. The big race in Chamonix? So now that, now that I finished the Val d'Aran, that qualifies me uh, for a place without normally you have to go through a lottery. So you put your name in the hat and sometimes it might take three years for them to pick your name. Even if you've qualified, if you, if you have the, the correct number of points, you have to collect points from different races. Even if you have the correct number of points, your name goes into a lottery and you have to be drawn out and it may take three years before you get your chance. If every year you, you get rejected but finishing Val d'Aran means that I bypass the lottery. So I have a guaranteed spot for 2022. Um, so in a year, a year from now, I will be preparing to, uh, to go and run the, the big one. Yeah. Yeah. Which, so by all accounts is not as technical, same distance. In fact, a little bit further distance. It's about 105 miles and uh, same elevation, 10,000 meters in the Alps but slightly less technical terrain. So it should be a bit quicker. And I will also race it. So I will try and get a decent time for me. Well, I don't know if that's 35 hours maybe or something or, or 40 hours could be. Um, I'd probably aim for something like, like that. That's uh, awesome. Yeah. Wow. Still two nights of running. Yeah. It will be. So how, how do you train for this? How do you train for like, did you do anything specific for this or did you just continue like running? Um, no, I, I, I do specifically uh, think about what kind of terrain I'm going to be running on and make sure that I do some training, which is specific. So we talk about Zwift. I was going to, um, yeah, I was going to say, do you yeah, yeah. use the Swift? <laughs> it's, yeah, because interestingly, um, obviously you might think that running on a treadmill is no good as training for doing a mountain trail race. But in fact, you're, you know, it, what, tr what treadmill running does for me is it adds miles. It adds distance that I wouldn't normally do. If I didn't have a treadmill, I probably wouldn't run as many miles per week as I do. And also on Zwift, every Tuesday and every Thursday, I have my own event in the Zwift um, calendar, which is the film My Run 500. So every Tuesday morning and every Thursday morning, I set my treadmill at 12% elevation and I run, I not very fast, but I run uphill for five, 500 meters elevation gain. So that's twice a week. Every week, 1,000 meters of elevation gain on the treadmill. That's as well as all the other treadmill running I do. And then outdoors, if I'm approaching a race, I will definitely go and run um, some long trail runs, 30, 40 kilometer trail runs, uh, making sure that I go downhill, uh, down some gnarly technical terrain to train my legs for going down as well as up. And so I will try and do at least 
3000 meters of elevation gain a week, two to 3000 meters of elevation gain a week, 1000 on the treadmill, 2000 outside in the weeks leading up to a race like, like that. If I was an elite runner, I would be traveling a lot more to places like the Lake District or the Brecon Beacons in Wales or Scotland. Um, and I, I've got some friends who are elite runners who who regularly do that in the UK because that's all we have. We don't have anything very difficult in the UK. So we have to travel quite a long way to find somewhere that will train you for that kind of steep terrain and that kind of technical terrain. But as as I'm not elite, I, I make do with what I have in this area mostly. Right. Um, <clears throat> so other than UTMB, Chamonix, um, what other things would you like to do in your running career? What do you have in mind that's like, I really would like to do this race? There are, there are many, many races in the U.S., that I would love to get to. Um, and the, the reasons, the, the, the things that are stopping me really are, are finances. Um, oh, it's because, expensive, yeah. It, well, yeah, and, you know, because it wouldn't just be me. I'd, I'd have to bring my wife and my children. We'd have to come on holiday. What we do, my, my friend Richard and I, uh, both of our families, we're good friends. We get on and every year we go on holiday together uh, to maybe the, to the Canary Islands and Richard and I, we book a race in the Canary Islands. So we've done trans Gran Canaria. Uh, we've done trans Volcania in La Palma. We've done Tenerife blue trail up TA day, the highest mountain in, in Spain. So we've done, so we do those things together. So it would be like that. We would have to come to the States and do, I, I, I would love to do Western States. I would love to do hard rock. Um, I'm, I'm not sure I want to try bad water. Maybe I would, I don't know. It's very hot, bad water. <laughs> um, I would even like to try one loop of the Barclay marathons. So there are a lot of races in the States that I'd like to, I'd like to try Bay 100. Um, that would be awesome. Uh, yeah. Right. Uh, I'd I'd love to go on the Appalachian Trail. I'd love to go to, on the Pacific West Trail. Um, so everything really. So you're not thinking about the Marathon des Sables or anything like that, like through the desert. That doesn't appeal to you as much. <laughs> well, it, it, it if if Marathon des Sable was uh, two hundred euros, then yes. But <laughs> okay. it's. What is it like? Three thousand euros? I know plus it's, it's just, expenses. It's yeah, yeah, it's it's, it's crazy. Not. I think it has to, and and also I think it's lost its reputation a little bit as one of. It's still regarded as a tough race, but I think it's lost its reputation. Really, it used to be regarded as the toughest race in the world to do, but it. I think most people agree now it isn't really. Um, that's not to say it wouldn't be really hard. Um, and I've never, I've never run in desert conditions like that before. Uh, so I'm not saying it wouldn't be a challenge, um, but it's not, it's not extremely high on my list of things to do. If, so, if I had a sponsor who said, we'll pay for you to go and do Marathon de Saab, then yes, of course, of course I would. Yeah. Okay. We are requesting a sponsor for Steven. We no, <laughs> not really. No, I mean, I have a, I see, am, I have I a sponsor, am. you know, I mean, I have a sponsor. Zwift have been great to me, but Zwift have, you know, the, um, sponsoring me to go and run in a, in a desert is not really their core right. um, market. You know, Zwift, Zwift are very keen to encourage 5k, 10k runners, half marathon and marathon runners the fitness market so um that they would be they're happy to sponsor people to run berlin marathon for example like the zwift academy runners are doing <clears throat> they're happy to 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 help with things like that um but i think an extreme trail race in the desert is probably not where they would want to put their money really um yeah they, they are a great sponsor, sponsor for you just for that one race a different <laughs> sponsor yeah. just to just to send me out to uh, to morocco yeah yeah <laughs> yeah see that's one that i would i would love to 
run through the desert. There's a few races. You know, there's another one in Tunisia that's an ultra race as well. That's kind of newer. There's um, I forget the name, but what's the one in South Africa? There's one in South Africa which uh, is the Midnight Desert. No, there. In fact, there are quite a few crazy desert races. Um, there's one in the Death Valley in the United yeah. States that you actually, yeah. But the well, Death bad Valley bad water. Been- Badwater one three five is I mean that's that's through desert isn't it that's that's a that's a crazy race. Um, yeah, there are many crazy, but this you just did to the Pyrenees. I think is gonna. <laughs> yeah, it's gonna... It, yeah, I'm not gonna do one quite as crazy as that for a long time. Even UTMB next year won't be as crazy as that one I've just done. No, no. Did you do anything to celebrate? Anything like special that you said? Okay, this is. Kudos to me. This is just. Oh, it was, yeah, no, you know, just not really. I, 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 I paid. I paid twenty euros to go in the spa. Is that <laughs> is that celebration? <laughs> well, I mean, it depends on how good it was. <laughs> I think. I think the celebration. I think the celebration was the whole thing. Was going because we've been locked down in the UK for so long. It was my first trip abroad, and I, I thoroughly made myself enjoy being in in spain for for a week you know i was there for i went out there two days before the race i I stayed for a couple of days after you know i made sure i enjoyed it um and that was a celebration in itself just being abroad being away um i loved it yeah and traveling is i recently had to travel for work and it was the first time i was in a plane and in a hotel for like last two years i think or a year and a half so yeah yeah, it it just feels like you don't realize how lucky we were you know like one of these things happens and it was such a massive event yeah Yeah, and then you forget crazy you you forget about it too really quickly because now here in the united states we are like we at least it seems like we have the worst behind us and and you go back to your normal life so quickly you see someone with a mask and it's like, oh, wow. Yeah. yeah. Now I remember that just, you know, like yeah. last year, everybody like, we I, had to wear a mask all the time. So, Well, I'm the, the, those. So those rules have now gone in the UK, but I'm still self-isolating from my run. So um, I came back uh, last Wednesday. I have to stay in the house for 10 days. So tomorrow's my last day. Oh, wow. Um, I didn't realize that. So yeah, yeah. So I've been self isolating in the UK, um, but then um, so I'm free tomorrow. <laughs> so it's it's good that you have Swift. <laughs> yeah, Swift yeah, a, yes, exactly. Yeah. It's, I wouldn't it's be able to run. Oh, yeah. I during lockdown, it was just even though where I live, you can we you could run in the you know in the street, but um, it's such a I mean it's it's such a great platform. Yeah. Good. So if people want to find you, where can they do so if they want to connect with you? Okay. So it's, uh, there are, there, there, I have two YouTube channels. So, um, I don't, um, I'm not very good at regularly posting videos on film my run. So, but if you would like to go and subscribe to the film, my run YouTube channel, every, every, um, outdoor race that i do mostly i film my outdoor races and i edit the video and i put that online and that's where they will go so right now um the there's a brand new video online of a race i did in 2019 which i dnf'd uh, which is tds from chamonix so that's the latest one that's on my on my web on my youtube channel called film my run so you can subscribe there but then for Zwift, I have a different channel, which is called Zwift Run Live. Uh, you can subscribe there and there you will see me a lot more often because um, I am live almost every day. Maybe I have a break at the weekend sometimes, but mostly Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, you will find me live broadcasting for half an hour to an hour um, of running live on Zwift, um, either focusing on myself or my wife or the runners in the community on Zwift running, um, I, I focus on them as well. So, uh, so if you want to, if you want to see regular um, Zwift running, then that's the place to go. Yes. So both of those, both of those channels, really. 
And I know that you were one of the people actually that enticed me to start using Swift. Because I was like, there's going to okay. be something to this. <laughs> there's so, I mean, I heard about it, that the concepts when you don't really, it's, it's kind of like just a concept, like how does this work? But then I found your channel through Film My Run. So I discovered you. Yeah, I think YouTube showed me your Swift channel after that. And I was like, oh, this is like a really cool thing. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. So, so one thing I try and do fairly regularly is um, Zwift t uh, tutorials. So, I'll we record. We have so many um, of them. Yeah. 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 I th I have a series called How to Run on Zwift, and um, it's just me talking about the technicalities of of how to set up or do various things in Zwift. So, I haven't done one of them for a little while. Actually, I should do an, an update of some some information. But yeah, so so if you want to find anything about how to run on Zwift, then then type how to run on Zwift into into pop. YouTube, <laughs> and I should pop up somewhere. Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean that's I think that's one problem that Zwift still has. They 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 have to make it very easy for people to get on board to to get the technical things right. We still have so many questions about what foot pod should I use or, or people not even realizing that you have to use a foot pod or can I, can I use my watch to run on Zwift? And, um, I, and the, at the, at the, the base of it, it's quite simple. Just put a foot pod on and, and you can connect, but there are so many other, cause you can use your watch, but it depends what watch you have, you know, or you can, you, you can buy the treadmill sensor, or you can buy a smart treadmill or you can buy the Under Armour hover shoes, which have a foot pod built in. You know, there are so many ways that you can run on Zwift uh, and it sounds as though it could be very complicated, but actually it, it isn't really you just just get that foot pod and it doesn't matter what treadmill you have. You just use the foot pod and you're away, as, as you know, of course. Yeah, that's um, that's what I do. I have my treadmill my laptop and then um the foot bot and it's it's you know if you get the swift foot bot it's 30 i think yeah. it's 35 dollars here in the states i mean it's really and then you don't have to pay for the platform which is just ridiculous i yeah. mean it's amazing that you don't have to yeah yeah because it's a lot of fun for zero <laughs> so. yeah exactly exactly and a lot of times um i, I used to have a stack of uh, zwift pods and you know i've run out of them now but people used to come on the zwift forum and say oh what do i need to get started on zwift and uh, or, or they've sold out of all the zwift pods and i say well here you are i'll just send you one for free so i just used to send people a foot pod and uh like i say i haven't got any left now and zwift haven't sent me any more so i can't Maybe do that at the moment but they've they, been out yeah, of stock yeah, yeah, for think, a while yeah yeah so you you could in theory, you could spend nothing. And and also, if you use maybe Pascal's Run Client app or the treadmill speed sensor, if you have two devices, you you definitely don't need to spend any money. Right. If you have it, if you already have a treadmill. Yeah, Run Client has never worked for me. I don't know why. Really? Yeah. Okay. I tried my iPhone because I used to have an iPhone for work. I tried the iPhone. It definitely doesn't work on my Samsung. Yeah. So. Okay. And then I just, you know, it's for me, it's fine with the brown bot, so... Yeah, yeah, yeah. But that's yeah. the other thing. If if people are not very tech savvy, any problems could put them off. You know, if you, you, you somebody says, "Oh, use RunCline," and like you, and so they put it on their phone, it doesn't work. Then the risk is that they lose interest and they don't follow up and try something else. Or um, that that still is an issue, I think, for Zwift to to encourage people, just yeah. trying to make it as easy as possible to get and on. I yeah, and I, I think the key for them, and I don't know if they have this or if they even can make it happen, but if they could have, instead of chatting for runners, if you could just use voice, that would be, yeah, it would take off so quickly. Like when you play in a PlayStation, like my son plays with friends, they're constantly talking. That would be, I think, the, a huge success for them. They could, there, are, there are loads of things that they, that they could and should do with running um, or with Zwift as a whole. And I think... Anyone who's anyone who's on Zwift at the moment knows that it's quite quiet at the moment. There's not a lot of development happening uh, that we can see. And I have a big feeling that they are working on something in the background um, 
like a Zwift 2.0. So a brand new, completely rewritten Zwift from the ground oh, up. That would be awesome. Because I think that yeah, there's there's a difference in between the old worlds like Utopia and then all the new like Japan, what they did with it. Yeah. I think it was much, much. I mean, there's there's a substantial improvement, I think, in, in all the different worlds as they have developed them. So there, so they there have is good developers, yeah. They do, but they're the I think the core the core of the game is written on um an old gaming engine. And they need a they need to upgrade the whole thing to make it more efficient, and and I think that's I think that's what they're doing, um, and I'm hoping that in a year's time, we'll be looking at hopefully a brand new version of Zwift, um, with all the same worlds but just just streamlined, and which would make fixing bugs a lot easier, more straightforward, and especially all the, the running bugs that we know we have. And then new features, like you say, like voice chat in game, um, and, uh, and maybe an in, maybe a, an internal foot pod in the game. So if you don't have a foot pod, if you don't have a smart treadmill, you can get on any treadmill, you can turn on Zwift, um, and you can set Zwift to move your avatar at five kilometers an hour, 10 kilometers an hour, and it will just go. And then you can set your treadmill to the same. Obviously, that means people could cheat as well if they wanted to. But, you know, we have heart rate and cadence to make sure people don't cheat in races. But just to get people started, that might be a thing that they could do. Right. Right. I mean, it, it's I, I laugh. I'm a huge fan of Zwift. I love it. Yeah. Sometimes it's, you know, I choose purposefully to run inside, even though it's beautiful outside because I want to run on Swift. So because there's an event yeah, or something. Yeah. I, you I, I do that cool as well. Hats and shoes and <laughs> t-shirts. And yeah, it's like, I want this t-shirt. I'm, I'm not going to yeah, run yeah. outside. I'm, yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, I, I've certainly, I've certainly, even on a nice day, I've certainly sometimes chosen to run on Zwift specifically because I want to rather than outside. Um, yeah, it, it, it does happen. Yep. Or do you know that certain people are going to run and then you're like, okay, I want to run with them. Yeah. Yeah. Because yeah. you make friends in Swift. I mean, it's, it's social. Of course. Yeah. It's, like, it's like, I've always said it's, it's like having another running club. So I, I'm a member of a running club here in the UK. I go out um, with them maybe once a week. Um, although my wife has stolen all my sessions at the moment. So she's doing, <laughs> she's training for a marathon. Um but on Zwift, I have many, many friends and people I know, some people I know, some people I've met in real life, some people I've never met before and live on the other side of the world, but they're all still this community and, and like being in a, a running club and we give each other support and we give each other encouragement and, and we arrange to meet at certain times in certain races, in certain places, just like you would outdoors. Right. There's, you know, the Swift long distance runners. On, the, on Facebook, yeah. there, there's a group of them that I actually never met in real life. They're going to run the Loch Ness Marathon together. So they meet oh, wow. on Swift. They have runs, like they're doing the same training plan. So they meet for their like speed work and like tempo runs. And yeah. Awesome. It's really, really cool. They, said, they sent me a message. They're like, hey, we're recruiting people if you want to sign up. And I was like, September, it's really a bad. <laughs> I mean, I'm sure it's a great race, but, you know, my schedule just didn't allow for me to just it's a long way for you to go yeah but there's people from here from the states that are actually hopping on a plane and going to oh really yes yes they have i think they have like 15 people doing it yeah they're all training to run it together like they're yeah yeah yeah. the same outfits and they're gonna wear yellow tops yeah yeah they have like a i think they're gonna have team nessie i think team nessie i should go up there and film them i should go and film them Oh, get on. Um, I'll send you the names of the people who are running. Send me the link. Yeah, send me yeah. send me some information. They have. They, there's awesome. even a club on Strava for them. So I they, don't know when it is because I'm I'm going to Scotland in September. I'm doing the Ben September. Nevis Ultra in September. I think it's a twenty. I actually don't remember. It's in September. Okay. Yeah, they were like on send me, week. Send me, send me some more info. Yeah. I think they're on week ten of their training. 
So they have mm-hmm. eight more weeks, I think, to go. It's got to be in the beginning of September, maybe. I don't know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm not sure, but it's awesome. in September. Yeah, I'll send you the links. Okay. Good. Thank you so much for coming hey, on the it's show. It's been a pleasure. And, and talking it's been a pleasure. to us. Yeah, and I'll see you. I'll see you on Swift. I'll see you around. <laughs> all the time. All the time. Yeah. Know, and uh, I, I do watch your videos as well. You did a great one when um, when Mercury Islands first opened. It's yeah. really good because you've been to some of the places that look similar yeah. and your photos were great. Really good. It's just like so they, it's really well done because when I was running through it, it's like, oh, wow, this is like this place I went to. And this like the temples are so similar. Like they really took great care into planning everything. Yeah. Yeah. And that made for a great video because it, it really showed that they had taken great care because you had photos of an actual temple, which looks exactly like or very similar to the one in Zwift. Yeah. And yeah, the, and the castles they have and all these little like um, lanterns. And I, I mean, it's yeah. really well done. Yeah. 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 It's my favorite world by far. It's good. It's good. I haven't run on it enough yet. I don't think. I, I'm just disappointed that they took it off. Like it used to be every day you could run in Japan. Now you cannot anymore. <laughs> it's like sometimes you, you the day that you're going to run on Swift, it's not available. So you um you you run Swift on a laptop though, don't you? Yes. Yeah. So you can you can download a program called Swift Preferences, and Swift Preferences. If you look it up, Swift Preferences gives you a little program which allows you to choose any world you want at any time, anywhere. This is the best kept secret. <laughs> I didn't know that. Just type into Google Swift Preferences, and look at the website and download the Swift Preferences uh, app or or, or um, file. Uh, just read the instructions and it tells you uh, there are lots of other things you can change as well. Lots of other uh, things about how Zwift is presented to you um, uh, that you can change and alter just tick boxes. Uh, So, yeah, and you can choose. It doesn't matter what the calendar says. You can just choose whatever world you want. Oh, wow. I I wasn't aware of this. There's all these other little things that you can do. And so, but yeah, yeah. You know, there's you can't of... you can't do it on your phone or an iPad, but if you're on a computer, then there are lots okay, of things so you can do. I, yeah, I'll look into it because again, yeah. it's just my favorite place to run. I really find it like so. I don't know. It's it's really nice. So mm. it's really real. It feels very real. Not not as flat as not that the other worlds seem. But you know, when you're running through London, it's it seems, seems a lot more like, detail. Yeah, yeah. But the other the, ones that's seem... that's been a problem though because they the they say that um, running that world takes a lot more computing power, a lot more um, graphics power to run. And it's, and some people have complained that it's uh, slow to render. Uh, So uh, that's another thing they're working on is trying to speed up how um, that world renders and loads in on your, on your game. Right. Um, I, I was running on it the other day. <laughs> it kept dropping me on the sky so I could see everything. It was the coolest thing, though. But I was just <laughs> running on top of everything, like on top of the water. Well, that, like, yeah. From was... up on top. It's like, how is this even possible? Like, <laughs> Yeah. So I suppose some of those bugs can be quite fun uh, at times. Oh, it was like, and I tried several times and it would just drop the avatar. It was the, I was like, what is going on? Like, my avatar would fall from the sky and just fall and just stop there and I would just start running and I would see the boats and the temples. It was, I took pictures. It was, <laughs> wow. it was so cool, but then it never happened again. It was like, I, I was wondering, yeah, yeah, yeah. it was, it was really nice. So <laughs> I mean, it's, beautiful. Uh, that was an odd one. Anyway, Stephen, that Good. was great. Okay. Thank you Thanks, so Susie. much. Thank you. Thank you very much as well. So talk to you soon. See you on Zwift. See you on Zwift. <laughs>